Peace be with you. I'm Pastor Stephen Jurdy at Zion and Bethany Lutheran Churches, and this is Your Word at the Middle of the Week. And we will be joined shortly by Pastor Johnson, who will be um, joining me and you all in continuing to go through the book of Revelation. Uh, we've been listening to St. John's record of what he saw and heard when he was in the Spirit one Sunday morning on the Lord's Day, and how God revealed to him the fulfillment and the end of all things. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so we were looking through chapter 10 last week and getting into chapter 11, and we will continue in that vein today. And again, we are waiting for Pastor Johnson to join us. And once he does, we will get into it. Uh, one thing I've mentioned before that I think is important to remember about Revelation, and one reason why I think Revelation is so interesting to people, is not just that it talks about the future, and that's interesting to us, but it's, it's beautiful. It is full of images. It is image rich. Um, looks like maybe Pastor Johnson did not connect here, <clears throat> but he will shortly. Revelation is image rich. It's just full of Old Testament Im images brought forward from the Old Testament um, that God uses like an artist with a palette, you know, to paint this vision of how he will fulfill all things. And so we will start what? Analyzing. Yep, yeah, Pastor Johnson is here. And so I'm going to try to add him. Um, let's see here. Come on, Pastor Johnson. Add. No answer from live video guests. It's saying you're not answering, Pastor. I'm going to try again. Still no answer. You know what? I'm going to uh, I'm going to conclude this, or I'm going to pause it at least, and then unless Pastor Johnson wants to try being added again. Oh, he's gone. I think he left and he's coming back on. So we'll give him a chance to do that, and then we'll try it again. There he is again. Add, add. No. He shows up. There he is. Hello, Pastor Johnson. Oh, good morning, Pastor Gertie. <laughs> Welcome back from hunting. Pastor Johnson was out in the woods uh, the past few days. So uh, partaking of one of Wisconsin's uh, most venerable traditions here. So how was how were the outdoors? It was beautiful. A little <laughs> brisk a few of the mornings, but the sun would come out and warm up the uh, the land and, and, and also the feet and hands. So uh, it was beautiful. Not a whole lot of deer to be seen where I was, um, but it was definitely a beautiful picture of God's uh, good world that he sustains us with. Yeah. So glad to be indoors. I think I'm good good to go for a while now. Okay. All right. Sure. Sure. Well, I'm glad you're able to be outside for a while. It's a, you know, it's a beautiful time of the year, I always think. November, you know, the, the land just uh, is rich with all these earth tones and and with the transition from fall to winter so enjoy enjoy seeing that and glad you were you were out there and glad you're here today so we are in uh chapter 11 correct uh we did we finish chapter oh. 11 oh no we we didn't do the last trumpet i don't yeah. think yeah i don't think so either so 11, yeah 11 15. 11 15 okay um used to be I, I don't know do we read you know for three and a half oh yeah we talked about the three and a half versus the three and uh all the image all the imagery there of 1260 days and 42 months and uh yeah okay good so we're into the seventh trumpet we're at uh verse 15 and um uh why don't you go ahead and read that pastor johnson and and we'll get into it all right. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. 
And the 24 elders who sit on their throne before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. So, last week when we looked at the first part of chapter 11, we heard about the two witnesses who were killed in Jerusalem, but who refused to be in a tomb, and who were not only raised from the dead, but who were exalted to the right hand, of, or exalted to uh, the presence of God in the eyes of all of their enemies. And so, and that was after three and a half days. So what's being said here is, you know, Jesus is raised in three days. This now is the second re resurrection of, um, uh, you know, symbolized by the three and a half days to John. And then the two witnesses are the church. Uh, we might think Jews and Gentiles reconciled together into one body of the church, witnessing to Christ uh, in the world and suffering for it, but ultimately triumphing and being exalted in the eyes of their foes, uh, the church. So that's good news. And it's right after that, then, that the seventh trumpet <clears throat> is blown, the seventh angel blows, blows his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven. Not a single voice here. There's a loud voice in heaven. Voices. So we can imagine all the hosts of heaven uh, crying out and saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now, one question we might pose is, is that something we can only say when Jesus raises the dead at the end of time? Or may we already say today that the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ? And what say you, Pastor Johnson, to that question? Uh, I would say both. Um, the, the particular moment that I'm thinking of during the divine service, of course, is the celebration of Holy Communion, the body and blood of Christ given and shed for us. Here is a place in which the kingdom of Christ invades the kingdom of this world uh, and makes heaven present. Um, the future, God's future comes to this present evil age to give us God's blessing. And so it's, it's an already not yet kind of a thing, uh, which is a, a huge tension that is um, throughout the New Testament scriptures that the kingdom of God has come, repent, as Jesus says, uh, but it's not here in its entirety, oh. right? Um, so we, we wait for the full mm -hmm. consummation of that kingdom for when Jesus returns, but the Lord does not leave us bereft. He does not leave us orphaned, as Jesus says elsewhere uh, in John's gospel. Um, and so the kingdom of God does make itself known and present in this kingdom of this old world that is passing away um, in, in the supper, in the word that is preached, uh, and, and the holy supper that is, is given to, to God's faithful people to sustain them, nurture them, um, forgive them their sins, and to let them know that God is on the move. Um, and what he has started, he will one day finish. Yeah. <clears throat> Right. You know, it's uh, the kingdom of God is is hidden. Uh, the, the kingdom of God is is seen only by faith, by those whose eyes have been changed by the spirit uh, and discern by the word of God that the kingdom of God is here, as we see in the preaching of, of Jesus uh, and his apostles in the, in the Bible. And so and also then through the preaching of the church today. So we, we could say that the, king, that the kingdom of this world, and this is an important thing, the kingdom of this world has indeed become the kingdom of our Lord. Because we have this other passage that I think is 
germane here uh, in Romans that Christ died and rose for this purpose, that he might be Lord of both the living and the dead. So, you know, he's already the Lord of the living. Already our entire life is given to us by the hand of God. Now he's also the Lord of the dead because he has entered the realm of the dead. He has, you know, harrowed hell. He has, um, uh, you know, in, as, as the Orthodox saying, in Christ, when Christ rose, all men rose in him. Uh, all people rose in him. And so, which is not a sort of universalism that denies faith, but simply says that his resurrection is everyone's resurrection. Uh, that's the resurrection that we trust in. And so, um, even though we see the world not operating according to God's law, even though we see sin and injustice and suffering across the world, nevertheless, it is God's kingdom. And it's, his kingdom is hidden beneath all of that sin, just as it's hidden on the cross, beneath the sin of Christ's suffering. Uh, but yet the kingdom of God is there. We cannot deny, for example, the kingdom of God is there on the cross where Jesus is suffering, and yet we cannot see it there. But it's precisely in that suffering of Jesus that the kingdom of God is present and active and unfolding. And so also in the suffering of the church and the afflictions of this world, they're just the beginnings of the birth pains of this kingdom that, as you say, will be brought to its greater fulfillment um, at, the, at the end of this age. We really shouldn't say necessarily the end of time. I'm not convinced that time, per se, ends. But time, like everything else, will be um, transformed into something new. Uh, so there's a new, we see a new age. You know, age, uh, age is a term of time. We are in a present age. We are waiting for the new age. So when this age ends, the new age begins, then the kingdom in its fullness will be, will be ours. So as, and then you bring up that great tension, now, not yet. We have it now, but we don't have it yet. It's both and. It's sort of like saint and sinner. We are sinners outside of Christ. We are saints within Christ. That gets us into this. That we see the 24 elders again uh, falling on their faces and worshiping God. We spoke of the 12 apostles, the 12 prophets. Uh, <clears throat> what else do you see in this ending of chapter 11, Pastor Johnson? Mm -hmm. um, something else I see in this ending, uh, also looking at verse 15 about the, the kingdom of the world becoming the kingdom of Christ, uh, being the kingdom of, of God, the kingdom of Christ. Uh, it, it's also a, a stark reminder for those those Christians way back when, um, as well as for Christians today, um, who is in charge, mm -hmm. right? It, it's not uh, it's not the nations of the world, though they conspire and plot in vain. And then um, in verse 18, John says something very reminiscent to, to Psalm 2, um, right? Why do the why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The Lord who sits in heaven laughs at them, right? All their, all their plans and plots are, are for naught because the, the Lord who is bringing everything uh, to its fancy Greek word here, telos, its end, its, um, its fulfillment, its purpose, um, they can do what they do, plan what they plan, but ultimately God is in charge and the world is his, all right? I mean, um, that, that's the whole purpose of God uh, choosing Israel to be a blessing upon the nations and ultimately the new Israel, the church, uh, to be the blessing upon um, this world, which bears Christ, as we see in, uh, in a different form in, in chapter 12. Um, so just an important reminder that, uh, an important reminder for those early Christians who are hearing this, because right, they are a very small minority. They've got the Romans all over them. They're the mm -hmm. dominant power. They're the ones yeah. who think they hold uh, the, the keys of destiny, they're masters of the universe, and they're not. Um, and so all that earthly power is completely and totally trivialized because this world is God's um, and, his, and his Christ. So an important thing for everyone to hear, um, especially when we think about right. politics and whatnot, that it's, it's, it's Jesus' world. It's, it was made for him, and it will be perfected in him one day. Yeah. And as you point out, John was especially called to <clears throat> be an apostle and shepherd to these seven churches in Asia. 
who may be a representative of a larger church community in Asia, Asia. And so uh, Revelation, having been given through him, is uh, especially relevant word to them in its original context, uh, a word to them to, to endure. Uh, you, you pointed that out before, too, that the, the, each of the seven churches had a problem. And those problems related to be to remaining faithful, and so all of this is a call to faithfulness here in this you know here especially in its encouraging way, uh, you know throughout Revelations there's different ways that makes that comment um, sometimes or makes that point um, sometimes by way of rebuke and admonition here by way of encouragement that the kingdom of the world is the kingdom of the Lord, and so then that also applies to us today. Verse 19, then God's temple in heaven was opened and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. <clears throat> What's happening there? Mm -hmm. Because God, the bo body of Christ is the temple, right? The body right. of Christ is the temple. And uh, so then... What's the Ark of the Covenant, and what is this temple, and how are we to understand this verse? It's, it's full of, that again, that, that, that rich imagery from the Old Testament being employed here to make a point. What's, what is it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's an important reminder for those old, old those Christians back in the day, um, as well as us, um, where all this power resides it all resides in god and god makes his power known um in jesus right and where the presence of god has been localized as it were um during his earthly ministry in, in jesus christ and so yeah like you said there's those old testament allusions especially from um exodus chapter 19 with the giving of the commandments on on sinai with the flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder, just this, uh, you know, just an earth-shaking moment. Um, that moment is going to be yeah. eclipsed by by Jesus, who he who is the very temple of, of God. Uh, so that's one thing I, I mm -hmm. see going on here. Mm. Um, yeah, for sure. And of course, the temple in heaven being opened uh, the Ark of Covenant being seen in the in in the prior years of of Israel's history, the Ark of the Covenant was only brought out for certain occasions, specifically yeah. for the sake of leading God's people into battle. And I wonder if some, if one thing that's being said here is that uh, God's God's headed to battle. Uh, because we're going to be now seeing the woman and the dragon and the beast, and there's going to be a lot of conflict. I mean, it's just a thought uh, that mm -hmm. that with the appearance of the Ark of the Covenant, it's also signaling the time for battle has come. And and then likewise, it reminds me of the um, the temple curtain being torn in two at the crucifixion and death of Jesus. Uh, indicating that that there is a new accessibility to God in Jesus Christ, as as uh, Paul writes in Ephesians, since we have access to this grace, uh, we now have a new access to this grace, and so Christ is revealed. Christ, the body of Christ, is revealed. Christ is open to the people. God is preparing for battle and heading out to redeem and save His people, because this is his kingdom he's going to make sure the whole world knows which kind of sets us up for something exciting i don't know we'll see definitely <clears throat> all right um chapter 12 would you please read verses one through six there sure and a great sign appeared in heaven a woman clothed with a sun with the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars, she was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great dragon with seven heads and 10 horns and on his heads, seven diadems. 
His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared for God, in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, and then verse 7, I'll just throw verse 7 in there. Now war rose, arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He is thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So, wow. I mean, this is, I mean, really, this is probably one of the scenes most memorable uh, to people from the book of Revelation. And for good reason, a woman clothed with the sun and wearing a starry crown, a crown of 12 stars who gives birth to a male child caught up to heaven. <laughs> Excuse me. And a great dragon appears with seven heads, seven, ten horns on his head, seven diadems. Um, as I understand it, you know, the, the dragon here, uh, this great red dragon, who's described in verse 3 as a sign, a sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and his ten horns and his heads and seven diadems. It's, a, it's kind of like a, a you know, it, it's an attempt. This is like uh, someone trying to be somebody else. The, the, the dragon's trying to be like the lamb. The lamb which has... Let me just go back to chapter 5 and read that. Uh, we saw the lamb earlier in chapter 5. And uh, how does it describe him? And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And so the dragon, the devil, who is the devil, we find out later in verses 7 and following, uh, is trying to be... Christ. He's trying to be like the boss. And in fact, he's the antichrist here. I mean, he's, he's the opposite of Christ. He's opposed to Christ. And it's just a made up fallacy that he is trying to pass off to deceive the world. And he especially goes after the woman who gives birth to the male child. Now, is this woman Mary? And is the male child Jesus? What do you think, Pastor Johnson? Well, I know there would be a, a, a um, strong Catholic push for some to say that, uh, but uh, we would, mm -hmm. as, as Lutherans, and also taking it, you know, taking in all the biblical witness, it, it'd be hard, we'd be hard pressed to associate that with Mary. Um, I think it'd be one of the allusions here that John is getting at um, is the the image of of the church, right? Um, he uses images in which it's kind of a collective image where, where one thing represents a whole group of other things like this. Uh, this woman who represents right. the church, right? Um, it, is, it is from the church that the, the Savior comes um, from God's people. Um, and so, I mean, there's allusions also here to Eve giving birth to the, to this, to the, the, the promised seed from Genesis chapter 3. You know, Eve and Adam representing all mankind, and then from them comes the Savior. And so here are, here's a woman, a symbolic representation of the people of God, and this is from from where the the Savior comes. Um, and so it, it's it's an invitation to see that we are wrapped up in a cosmic struggle. Um, I think that's one of the one of the important themes here in Revelation chapter 10, that we are um, at war with the, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, we are at war with the, the prince of the power of the air, right? That there is a cancerous force in this world 
uh, led by Satan, who we heard about earlier, um, that, you know, fell from heaven. And, and then you see that here also with his tail knocking down all the stars. Well, a little bit later, was, you know, we saw it here, right? A third of the stars coming down. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it's, uh, again, just the, an invitation to, to see ourselves in, in view of biblical history that th this is this is the perennial issue for the people of God is is Satan Satan trying to devour um, God's faithful people and even trying to kill the very own the, the very Savior of the world, which of course we know he failed. Um, though on the cross he thought he might have been triumphant, uh, but he wasn't. That in his greatest moment of weakness, God shows a strength um, rising from the dead. So again, I would say the woman is a representation of, of the people of God, of, of the church, and that's from who, from where the Savior comes, whence the Savior comes. So in support of what you say there, <clears throat> we have uh, John earlier in his letters to the church uh, referring to that elect lady, right? Uh, I believe it's in... in well, I don't want to guess. I, it's in Second John, I think, it but maybe it's in, yeah. yeah. Second John, verse 1, the elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, often taken to be a description of the church to which he's writing, the elect lady and her children. Why the elect lady? Well, because the church is described throughout John's gospel, uh, and as well as other places in the New Testament, as the bride of Christ. Uh, not specifically perhaps in John's gospel, but that marital imagery is so thick in John's gospel. It's in places people don't even realize. So that the bride of Christ and the church are this, are this woman. Um, and then in verse chapter two, uh, earlier when Jesus is speaking to the church in Thyatira, this is chapter two of Revelation, he says, beginning at verse 26, or verse 25, only hold fast to what you have until I come, the one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end. To him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with an iron rod, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. And so there he describes the children of the church, the, the faithful ones who hold fast to the gospel, as those who will rule with an iron rod and that reminds us that in john uh as well as in the rest of the new testament the church and jesus are viewed as united together what the one has the other has and so jesus says just as my father has sent me so also i send you or when we hear jesus say i am the light of the world we also hear scripture say you christians are the light of the world and so to see in the male child birthed by the elect lady not only Jesus, but also all those who are faithful with Jesus and because of Jesus um, is, is exciting. It again emphasizes the triumph that the church is, uh, the church's children, the church's faithful ones are gathered up into heavens. They're, they're safe, uh, even as Jesus is exalted to the right hand of God. And then the woman running out into the wilderness, uh, that perhaps is the, the, the church continuing to endure in a world of suffering for an appointed period of time. Uh, the church continues to endure and to uh, persevere, is the word I'm looking for, in faith, mm -hmm. despite the attacks and onslaughts of the devil uh, trying to appear as though he is the Christ. Um, but boy, what beautiful imagery, clothed with the sun, crowned with stars, um, reminding us that the church is um, the, the church is what, what do I want to say? The church is the, is the, is the, is, is the fulfillment. It's the, it's the, it's the first harvest of the earth. It's why the creation is made ultimately. Because God's intention is that the church should know Christ. So I saw earlier someone few weeks ago so insane it's so arrogant of, of christians to believe that this whole universe was made just for the sake of the earth and of course the response is it's not arrogant it's very humbling to believe that that god should make a whole universe just for the sake of human beings on earth 
and this globe and all of its creatures that he loves. Uh, and and uh, it reminds me of a painting I saw yesterday by Peter Paul Rubens. Uh, if again, if we had better software here, we would we have to show you painting it. It's a ridiculous painting in many ways. It's a painting of a marchioness, which is a the wife of a marquis or a, um, a, a noble woman. And uh, perhaps she's a noble woman in her own right. I don't know, it doesn't matter. Anyway, she's sitting there uh, just outlandishly arrayed in this, you know, just almost grotesquely ornate dress. Uh, it's, it's a stunning painting and probably one of Rubens' best. But, <laughs> but it also reminds us of kind of what the church is and what the human race is. We're just, we're arrayed in this universe so far that we have seen. We're arrayed in it, that, that God creates this whole thing out of great love. This is, that woman was profoundly loved and cared for. So is the earth profoundly loved and cared for. We see that in the woman as well, the church um, arrayed with the sun, crowned with the stars, the moon under her feet. She rules with Christ. And then that brings us to the war in heaven. What time is it? It's 9.05, so we've, we've kind of done our time here as it were. Uh, yeah. So we'll pick up next week at verse seven in chapter 12. And Pastor Johnson, fresh from the fields and the forests and the glens, uh, would you in your refreshed space pray for us? Absolutely. Let us pray. All right. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that before the final woe, we hear this wonderful picture of and see this wonderful picture hear these wonderful words of the promise you have for your faithful people your bride the church help us lord to be faithful in the midst of the many struggles that may come our way those struggles outside of us and those struggles that we also feel and experience within help us to be discerning to know good from right unrighteousness from uh from what is righteous Help us to be able to discern, especially if something seems too good to be true, that we may faithfully live our lives following you, not being tempted away from what is good, right, and beautiful. As Satan sought to disguise himself with diadems, and as Satan tries to disguise himself like an angel of light, as Paul says elsewhere, help us, Lord, to be faithful to your son, Jesus, he who is the true morning star, who leads us to greener pastures, who brings your heaven to this world and blesses us because of his power, his might, and his love. Help us, Lord, to be faithful in this struggle. Help us to be true to you in all that we do and in all that we say. We pray all this and ask all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Pastor Johnson. And the Lord's peace be with you. And with all of our viewers this day, and a blessed National Day of Thanksgiving tomorrow, we're called upon by our nation to offer thanks to God. And so we, as Christians, uh, happily obey that summons. And would our nation not have issued such a summons, Christians would still do so. Um, this is something that's sometimes forgotten. I mean, the reason why the pilgrims did what they did is because that's part of the Christian tradition, which is to have a, a harvest festival in which Christians pause and give thanks for the harvest and, and all the bounty they have received. So we do that uh, in a cooperative way with all our fellow citizens in this nation, uh, rendering due thanks to the God of Israel, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for all his many benefits. So a blessings, blessings to all of you on that day tomorrow, and we will see you next week. Peace be with you.